So, uh, I'd like to welcome to the stage, and if you could join me in welcoming, please, John Sheridan. Nothing annoys me more than being spoken down to. When you're in a meeting, you haven't met the person before, and they've made assumptions about you, and all of a sudden, you can see that they don't actually understand you at all. They're already talking about things they think you know. They're putting words in your mouth. I even don't like it when I see it written in letters to me from vendors when they say, as you would be aware. Well, how do they know what I'm aware of? One of the challenges that I think we've got in empowering people is making sure we understand and we work to understand what it is that makes things work for them. I'm going to talk to you today about leading the Facebook generation. And some of you are probably already thinking, that's a discussion about people who are young. And I've got to tell you, it's not. It's a mistake to manage people on the basis of their age. You manage people, you lead people on the basis of what motivates them. And I'm going to talk to you today about what I think the Facebook generation is, based on some data that I'll show you, and then some points that I think we can do about how we make them, how we motivate them, how we lead that generation of people. Because they're the ones that we need to empower if we're going to get innovation in the public service. Now, the most important thing about this generation is it isn't the people that you think it is. Not at all. And yet, if you read the newspapers every day, particularly the, the Tuesday broadsheets that talk about technology, you read that stuff and you think, do they realise what audience they're actually speaking to? Do they actually have an understanding of how much people know about technology now? Let's have a look. Over 50% of Australians currently are on Facebook. That number went up about 46,000 from April to May, explained by the Social Media Australia website as probably being younger people joining in that period of time. And you think, well, that's right, half the people, that's not too bad, I suppose. But let's think about that for a, bit, a moment more. About 4% of Australians are over 85. I'm going to be a bit ageist here and say probably not many of them are on Facebook. And 15% of Australians, sorry, 19% of Australians are younger than 15. And I hope their parents are watching what they're doing on Facebook. And if you take that 23% out of the number of Australians, that means that the number of Australians who are actually on Facebook is twice the number of people who aren't on Facebook. Australians understand technology and they understand what's going on. We're a nat nation of fast adopters of technology. And ignoring this in the workplace is to stifle innovation. Let's look at how people use um, Facebook, what it is that they do, or social media generally. Look at the number, that top line there, that shows you what number of people use social media every day, what percentage of people. It's really quite high. Look also at where they use, um, sorry, the age groups, uh, particularly across the states and territories. 44% of people in metropolitan areas use social media every day. 51% of people in regional areas do that. That challenges, I think, the perception of what it is that people do. But look how many people use social media all over. Of, the, of this survey, and this is a Yellow Pages, a census survey of Australians done in, late in 2012, only released about a month ago. Look at the percentage of people who are using social media. And you'll see where I'm going with this in a moment. Look at where they're using it. Firstly, at the breakdown between um, the age groups, which is interesting. But then think of those of you who are in the ACT. What we can see is that 22% of people use social media while commuting in the ACT. Now, what's really interesting about that is I think only about 2% of people use public transport in Canberra. So as a, consequ a consequence, all of you are tweeting while driving. Stop it. Um, but the challenge there is to see this has changed what people are doing. It changes the way they get information. It changes the source of that information. Look at the devices they use social media on now. 
How many people are using mobile devices? Now, in 2009, when we did the Gov 2.0 task force, one of the biggest discussions we had about security, about what we did, was how we would empower people to use social media at work on their work equipment. Now, I'm not saying there's still people who would like to do that, but it's nothing like the problem it was once before. Why? Because everybody uses social media on their mobile phones, on their smartphones, on their portable devices. If you think, when you're running an organisation, the public service at work today in Canberra, if you think by blocking Facebook on your work computers you're keeping people off social media, then clearly you're on drugs, because that isn't what's happening. Right? People use this all the time. So what does this change in how it is they're doing? It changes the way they think and the way that they do things. First of all, the use of social media and, and the internet, rather than mainstream media, has made a very interesting change in how we get our information. Once upon a time, when you got the information delivered in the mainstream media, you didn't have much choice about what it is that you saw. I mean, yes, you could buy one paper rather than another, and that would give you a slightly different bias. You could watch commercial TV rather than the ABC or the SBS, and that would give you a slightly different bias. But generally speaking, the information that you were given was what someone decided you wanted to see. That isn't true anymore. People look at their own sources of information and decide what they want to see. Now, for those, and I'm sure it includes everyone in this room, with eclectic tastes and wide open minds, that's not really a problem. But some people only look at stuff they like. And if you like stuff that's on the right-wing lunatic fringe, or for that matter on the left-wing lunatic, left lunatic fringe, what you're going to see is things that reinforce your behaviour and your understanding all the time. So you're getting a different source of information. We have to think how we deal with that. People expect connectivity and access in their work. They expect to be able to get onto the web, get onto the internet, see things, attach to things, use social media. You can see the pressure to get, so to get wireless access on public transport in public places. I was in the US at Christmas time and every department store, every mall had their own Wi-Fi access and you could just move from one to the other, not actually having to pay for access at all. People expect that now. They've balanced very interestingly between sharing and privacy. And, and I do find this quite fascinating, particularly when you work in government in the area about talking about what you'll connect for people, how you'll expose services to them, what information you need to connect them up. Because we see that people are prepared to share almost anything on social media. And yet they don't want info necessarily want government to have information or to move information between departments so that services can be provided to them in a more effective way. Now, I think that balance is slowly changing. And eventually we're going to see an understanding that if people can select what can be shared, they're going to be willing to do that to get themselves better services. And why do I think that? Because that's why Amazon sends me ads about the US Civil War because they know they're the books that I buy. And by I'm, I actually like that. I don't have to make so many choices. It's easier for me to find them. I'm getting a service that I value at, as, at a consequence of giving up a bit of my privacy. And that works for me. It might not work for everybody, but I think there are trends changing there. People, are, because they've got a range of more information that they can see and they're used that they know that sometimes it's not actually right just because it's on the internet, they have an understanding about a bit of scepticism about what they see and read. But again, there's an interesting challenge about this because people get sucked in by silly stories on the internet all the time. If you think about the number of times you've seen you know, huge numbers of tweets about some star is dead or something like that has happened, people are prepared instantly, without thinking, to believe things. And there's an interesting challenge, I think, in what we do about managing people in those circumstances. Finally, people are comfortable with technology. Put up your hand if you own a car. Put your hand... No, keep it up, please. Put it down 
if you've opened the bonnet yourself in the last six months. So it's about 50 people haven't done that. 50% of the people haven't done that. Why don't you need to do that? Because actually the car runs pretty well by itself these days. There are little alerts that tell you if you're running out of oil or you need a service or you do those, those sorts of things, but you're comfortable with driving the car. You don't think you need to be a mechanic to drive the car. Indeed, most of us get lessons when we're 17 and never pay any attention to anybody else except our spouses about how we drive for the rest of our lives. So, so we don't need to read the manual to do those things. We understand that. And I think that's where people are with technology at the moment. Now, what does that mean in terms of their expectations? Their expectation first is that technology just works. They know how to deal with it. They turn it on. It's there. And the corollary of that, of course, is if it doesn't work, their tolerance for it not working is incredibly short really, really short, measured in terms of five seconds. If you've got a, fee, a, a sort of text box that you have to type in something, you don't get a response in five seconds, the internet is broken. Okay? It's that sort of challenge that we see. People don't think they need to read the manual. Not just men, women also don't think they need to read the manual. They expect, naturally, I think, that when they turn a device on, it works, it should be intuitive, they understand what it should do. They know that if they want more information, it's available somewhere on the internet, generally for free and generally pretty quickly. They'll type something into the search engine and they'll be able to go to that fairly fast and find out what they want. And they don't just work at work because of the way, and, and this might not necessarily be a good thing, he says, having been judging GovHack things at 11 o'clock last night, um, the, the notion that people work just in the seven and a half hours a day they have to, or whatever, is changing. People want more flexible circumstances. They want to be able to do different things with their lives because they've got access to the information they need, not just in one place. And finally, they use their networks. They talk to people about their friends. They exchange information, views, recipes, a whole range of things enabled by social media and Facebook. They change their opinions as a consequence of what they see. They read reviews. They can see people liking things and not liking things, and that influences their behaviour. What does that mean, then, for what we need to do to make their work like life? so that we can get that innovation that people see at home all the time in all the activities they undertake, what do we need to do to deliver that at work? I'd put it to you that what we have to do is set up an, an environment for them where work looks like life and they're not making some sort of big change when they go inside the, the sort of rotating turnstiles. They're not, when they're putting their pass on, checking in, checking their brain at the same stand. We want to keep them engaged with what's going on. First of all, we need to make information available to them in a way that they can consume it. That these days doesn't mean our standard operating procedures for work need to be in A4 binders on a shelf. We need to provide them with innovation quickly so if they've got a good idea, it doesn't take half an hour to work out whether it's possible or an hour or six days. They can go and say, oh, well, I could actually do that. Yeah, look, it's OK because they've got that information quickly. We need to give them data so that it's available quickly. Now, I draw a slight distinction here between information and data because I'm trying to say when they look at things on the internet now, often they're seeing data um, as well as information. So they're going to look at the statistics of something. They're going to look at the thing they're buying from IKEA to see if it fits in their house. That's data. They're also going to look at the information, the reviews of those things, to see what it is that they're, whether that's a good product to buy as well. We need to make both those sorts of things available to people so they can be innovative. We need to give them choices about technology. And this is challenging in an IT environment that needs to be secure and needs to be reliable and they need to be able to depend on over time.
It's always interesting, I think, if you work with senior executives like I do, um, and, and we've, I've provided IT services to senior executives, to balance this demand to say, I want a whole range of technology, I want to be able to use the things I like, but I want you to fix them if they go wrong. And this is a challenge that we have to balance somehow. But people want those sorts of technology choices. We know that they decide the devices they like at home and they're used to those things. We need to think how we can encourage creativity by giving them those choices at work. We need to be flexible in what it is we do in the terms, in terms not just of the work environment, but allowing them to work in different ways and, different, and, and, and over different time spans and things like that. Now, interestingly enough, the public service has had flex time for a very long period of time now and it has provided the opportunity for people to be able to work at different hours. We've still got core hours that we need things in, but we need a way to manage this so that it can provide the flexibility that people need while maintaining the work that needs to be done. One of the things I think you'd all appreciate is frustrating if one of your team members is off at a critical period of time because they're enjoying the flexibility that, in, that public service involvement, employment provides, but they're not actually there when you need them. We need to think ahead and work out how we can manage that, to say, yes, it's all right if you're off that day, we understand, but at 11 o'clock, can you just check in to see the progress of this important thing? You can do that remotely, only take five minutes, but just check in to make sure we're on the right track. Some of that flexibility allows people to do innovative things because they're not constrained. One of the interesting challenges I see in some organisations is where people talk about the need to be innovative. They talk about the need to empower people. It's in their guidelines, in their values. All of those things are there. But you need a Deputy Secretary's permission to connect a DVD drive to your computer. Now, if you've got that that sort of thing in mind, if you think my life is so controlled that in order to connect a DVD, not something that's unusual you know, these days, indeed probably people don't even want to do that anymore, but in order to do that I need a Deputy Secretary's permission, but I'm encouraged to be innovative. That balance isn't there and we need to change that environment so that it is. We also need to encourage, encourage networking. People want to do that. They've always wanted to do it. Those of you who've been in the workforce force as long as I have will have seen people doing it around the tea lady. You'll have seen people doing it when tea ladies went around the kitchen. You'll have seen people doing it when smokers were um, banned, doing it outside. Um, people want to network. They want to discuss things. We need to put things in place that allow them to do that because they do it online now. We need to see what we can do at work in order to make that work as well. We need to have the right sort of support in place. I think it'll put the right sort of support in place as leaders to ensure that people can do the things that they want to do. They want information online so that they can find things. So we should be doing our training online so it can be done when they've got a few spare minutes, when they've got the ability to do it, when they're ready and not at a particular time necessarily. There are always going to be support mechanisms to do other things, but if you allow people to get on and do that themselves, um, it's, a real, I think, a really helpful thing. Because what you're doing is you're changing the way that behaviour is expected. You're saying, I want you to do this, you work out what time you're going to, you're going to do it, go, go away and fix it up. One of the interesting challenges I've seen, discussions in newspapers and things like that, um, in the um, parliamentary triangle recently, has been the change in bringing in, what, or what will happen in the future, bringing in paid parking in the parliamentary triangle. Now, no one wants to pay an extra $2,500 a year for parking. Everyone understands that. But, you know, the news that I have for people is that people can park by themselves on Saturdays and Sundays. When they get to work on Monday, they don't forget how to park. We don't need parking support groups or all those other sorts of things. What we need to do is just say, look, this is a change, a government policy. Yes, it impacts you. You know, that's the way it is. Um, Get on with it. Here's the, here's the resources you need. Here's where the car parks are. These are the rules. Get on and do it. We don't need to provide people a level of support that treats them like children. If you treat people like children, they'll behave like children. Um, 
internal, sorry, irritant, irritant reduction. I see the role of leaders to actually be a sort of bulldozer or steamroller, and I'm uniquely qualified for that, um, to be out in front of people, rolling the bumps out of the road so that they can do the good work and we take away the irritants so that they're not the things that, that slow them down. Because often what we find is for various reasons in, in bureaucracies, and I'm a you know, lifelong bureaucrat committed to bureaucracy, it's the lifeblood of democracy. But what you've got to do in those circumstances is take out the things that sometimes can only be changed by senior leadership. The notion that it's actually all right to do something this way and that, that build-up of momentum of change of to, over time that says, oh, no, we've always done it a different way. Challenging those irritants and moving them out of the way allows your people to progress more smoothly. We need to talk internally around this area of networking and allow people to do things. We know that people are social creatures. We see that the Facebook generation is prepared to share asynchronously all the time a whole lot of information to find things out. We need ways to harness that so that we can get that internal consultation. I think also as leaders, we need to provide access. Now, if you're a follower of Twitter, and I certainly am, it's fascinating to see how many people will you know, tweet important characters or things of important people expecting responses and sometimes get them. Um, not all the time, but sometimes they will. People have an expectation now of access. If you can't speak to your boss, if you don't know what they're thinking, if you can't interact with them, you don't have access, how are you going to know what to do? And this brings me on to my next point, which is about direction. I think the most important thing that leaders can do for the Facebook generation is give them the broad direction in which they want to go. It's important, I think, to borrow from what is essentially a German army term from before World War II. Now, I'm going to torture my uh, German accent to say Auftrag's tra tactic, but the important things to learn from this is that it's a German word, um, and think about tactic at the end, because I'm going to come back to that. I don't actually know what the other bits mean. Um, of th this, this policy or this method of doing things is a method of giving people direction and resources, of telling them what your intention is, what you want, and not how to do it. Because if you tell people how to do things, when they get to the end of your instructions, they'll come back and ask you what to do next. And if you've done that, you haven't empowered them at all. What you need to say to them is, I need this done, and I need this outcome at the end, and you have these resources. Go away and work out how to do it. If you want to come back and check with me, that's OK. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to clarify things. But what I want you to do is go out and get to that objective that I gave you. If you can get your staff doing that, they are going to be empowered because they'll know they have the choice about what to do. The next thing, I think, is to be the conductor, not the first violin. Now, there are a range of ways that this actually applies to what it is that we're doing. The first of these, I think, is to understand that if you've got two subordinates or two direct reports, you're going to micromanage them unless you're really, really careful. If you've got eight direct reports, you're not going to be able to micromanage them, generally speaking, because you're going to be too busy. Now, my personal opinion, not an official opinion at all, my personal opinion is we should make sure that we, give, that we remove this temptation for micromanagement by building structures that allow people to have a number of direct reports, a larger number, and get on with doing the work that they do, to trust their subordinates to achieve things. Because all of a sudden, if you're faced, well, actually, I'm the master of my own destiny in how I do this work and how I bring it about. My boss is interested in hearing what's going on and wants to hear what I have to say. I'm going to be more empowered. If you tell people what to do every day, if you say, today I want you to do this, I want you to do it this way, I want you to do, do it like that, use these things, they're not going to be using their initiative. They're probably going to do the work for you. They're probably going to do it. But when they reach a choice, when they reach a point that your instructions have run out or you're on leave and the circumstances have changed, if they don't know your intention, they won't know what it is that they should do next. 
And I think we need to change that in order to empower people. I learnt this um, a very long time ago when I was in the army. When someone said to me, what, I want, what you should be doing as a leader is using the reins, not the spurs. What you need to be doing is not having people or not arranging it so you have to push people on all the time, but rather that you have to provide some guidance to steer them in the right direction. Now, not a whole lot of guidance and not a tight rein necessarily, but that's what you should be doing rather than pushing people all the time. And my point would be, if you've, got, if you've got work that needs to be done like this and you've got people who don't work well like that, then maybe you need to help them find another job that suits their particular arrangements better. Because not everybody has to do this. Not everybody works the same way. They don't all have the same interests and changes. Find the people that you can do this with and encourage them because I'd put to you, they're the people who are going to be innovative. They're the people who, if you empower them, will achieve really good things for you. Two more points. The first is about innovation. I think this is a really challenging area for the public service. Um, and I'm going to touch on one of the reasons um, now and one of the reasons um, in a moment. The first is the notion of if you're doing things that are completely and utterly new, then there's a challenge about which ones might work and which ones won't work. And there's this discussion about saying, well, innovation requires a bit of risk, innovation requires failure, um, and we've heard other speakers this morning talk about it, and I think that's true. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is if you want innovation and if you know that innovation requires failure, what percentage of your taxes are you prepared to devote to failure? Because I'd put to you that one of the biggest challenges that we have in the public service at the moment is we have no margin for error whatsoever. And we see this in both the simplest things and the broad things. If you try a new, a new way of doing something and if you float a discussion paper, and in my, in my tiny little niche world of IT, I've seen this happen. You float a discussion paper, you put it out on, on a blog or something like that, you get a lot of comments, you, and you have something, you know, the government wants to do this. We think we'll have left-handed widgets everywhere. You get a whole lot of comments back that says that's not a really good idea. And you put out the policy without the left-handed widget bit, and the IT journalists write, government abandons left-handed widget policy doesn't know what they're doing. Why did they try that? It was a consultation. It was a discussion paper. The tolerance for failure isn't there. And one of, I think, the most challenging things we need to do in, in empowering people is work out how, as leaders, we can bring in a tolerance for error, bring in this way of having pe giving people the right to be wrong occasionally, not to do the same things wrong all the time, but the right to make mistakes and how we go about helping them learn from those. That's, I think, the biggest challenge that we have. Careful not to make the mistake of running over time. That's the end of um, my speech. I'm happy to take um, questions for a couple of minutes, um, if you like. Or not, I don't mind. Uh, up the back there, yeah. So there are a whole range of ways that that can be done. Yes, sorry. Oh, sorry. I've just been asked to repeat the question. Um, it's a question of balancing okay. the need for um, this notion of security in a bring bring your own device um, environment. And there are a number of ways that we can do that. Firstly, it's a question of what network we're connecting to. Secondly, it's a question of what method we're using for connecting. Um, there are plenty of um, technologies um, around at the moment that would, would, advise, would allow you to collect, connect to protected networks um, and not leave anything on the device. Those things exist at the moment. Um, there are ways of using iOS devices that um, can put, compartmentalise the work and do it on that. So there's a bunch of things. The technology solution is there already, um, I think, and we can use it. So if you have the solution there, why do we still have resistance? Well, I think what we... I'd actually put to you that we don't have resistance. What we have is inertia. 
right? And it takes a while to change direction and change the way that people are doing things. But they do change and they will continue to change over time. If you're not sure that that's the case and you're my age, you would go back to remembering when you had to book STD calls through the switchboard in order to make them and log the calls that you made. Right now, some of you probably don't even know what an STD call is. It's not bad, by the way. Um, it's, it's about subscriber trunk dialing, and it's a long distance call. And once upon a time, our phones at work were blocked, and you couldn't do that without booking a call and logging it. Government changed the way it, re it managed technology as a consequence of things. Did it change it fast? No, but it's government. Um, did it change it eventually? Yes. And is that an issue anymore for any of us? No. And I think that's... I've got a lot of confidence that that will change over time. I'm conscious that... Oh, one more. Pia works for me, it's OK. <laughs> I've got to tell you that I don't actually know. Um, and let me give you a very small example of this. A as you'd appreciate, we write briefs for the minister all the time. Um, we need to do work to make sure that those briefs are firstly well written, but also that um, there aren't spelling mistakes, trivial things, spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, things that make no difference to the policy whatsoever. But if someone gives me a copy of that brief and I know there's a spelling mistake in it, should I let the minister's staffer tell me off for there being a spelling mistake so that my subordinate, not Pia who spells very well, um, my, so, so, that, so that people who work for me get caught out by doing that? Um, or should I fix it for them in order to get it so that that's right? Now, that's a very trivial issue, but it's this, that, that sort of balance. I've got to tell you that I don't know the answer to this. I try and do things, try and allow people to do things, try and provide enough time in what you're doing so that people can do the work, learn from their mistakes and you still meet the schedule. You can do stuff like that. But I've got to tell you, it's a real challenge. No, I, I think that's a very good question. How do you balance accountability in the public service? Um, for my sins, I'm in charge of Commonwealth procurement and I'm responsible for the Commonwealth procurement rules. As soon as I say that to vendors, you know they're thinking that that's a vault full of information. 44 pages long, the first five say this is a set of rules, the last six say this was an interesting thing and here's an index. Um, about 33 rules, 33 pages worth of rules in a little book, large font, lots of space. The rules actually aren't anywhere near as bad as people think. And I'd put to you, not, not personally, obviously, but I'd put to you generally that often the rules, when you look at them, are nowhere near as restricting as people think they are. It's the practice, the, the way that people have done things that have made them restrictive. And if you look at what the rule actually says and say, well, actually, I could do this. Why don't I talk to my boss about how we might meet the requirements, provide the relative accountabilities and still get on and new, do new things, I think that can work. Now, it's a bit of a sort of rose-coloured glasses view, I know, but I do think that that works um, over time. So yeah, I, 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 indeed. They provide the boundaries, essentially, and if you stay inside the boundaries, um, then that's OK. Also, if you're accountable for your decisions. So, to at the risk of boring you, when, when we, decisions need to be made by me, I have a, my staff will produce a thing and I will sign saying, I have decided this and there's the file record. Now, it might not, might not be the right decision, but what I've done is I've, they've given me the advice, I'm accountable, I've made the decision, they've filed it, there's an audit trail that can be taken because people can tell me I've made the decision the wrong way, but I was the decision maker. Right? And I think that's what we need to understand. And the public service allows this all the time. If you're prepared to step up to the responsibilities and accountabilities, you can do an awful lot. Am I allowed to keep going? Nerida? Hi, sorry. Um, 
what I'm interested in is the difference between responsibility, accountability, and then authority. Because public servants are continually told they're responsible, they're accountable, you know, they're, they're using public funds. But then the, the level of authority to make a decision or to initiate something doesn't exist until you sort of reach some heady ranks. Um, and that's the thing I've observed over the years is that level of authority has actually gone up higher and higher where you used to have, say, an APS 6 could make a decision to do something quite minor, I suppose, or a delegation, but it seems to have moved its way up over the years and with lack of authority, yeah, that whole risk aversion side of things, how do we get people to take initiative when they feel they have no authority to do so? Um, over time, um, bureaucracies or organisations pull power up. Um, parents let their babies get away with a whole lot more than they let their children get away with. They let them get away with a whole lot more than they let their teenagers get away with, and they always blame their daughters-in-law. Um, the, the, the challenge, I think, is it's, an, it's the nature of organisations to pull power up in certain circumstances. As leaders, but there's no rule about that. There's nothing that says that has to happen. What we need to do, I think, as leaders, if we want to empower people, is to push the responsibility back down to the levels that it has at the moment. And we see that now. A bunch of people in the public service, lots and lots, have got credit cards that they buy stuff on for the Commonwealth all the time. Once upon a time, that wouldn't have happened. They would have had to get petty cash signed off and things like that. Now they can buy more than $5,000 worth of stuff or $5,000 worth of stuff without any of that procedure at all because that bit of the authority and accountability has been pushed down. That's what happens over time as long as we keep those, that pressure on. Thanks very much. <laughs>